On this episode of China Unscripted, we talk with Terrell Jones, who was a reporter in Beijing in 1989, about what he saw happen in Tiananmen Square, the time he ran from armed Chinese soldiers, and how one bad translation changed the media narrative about Tiananmen. Welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Zhang. And I'm Matt Ganesta. And joining us today is Terrell Jones, an instructor in international journalism at Claremont McKenna College and was an associated press correspondent in Tokyo, Paris, and New York from 1982 to 1997. But he was also in Beijing for a major historical event. Thanks for joining us. Uh, thanks for asking me to be here. Sure. So you were there in Beijing on June 4th, 1989, the day, as the Chinese Communist Party says, absolutely nothing happened. What was that like? <laughs> well, uh, I had gone to China uh, on May 12th from my base in Tokyo to help cover the visit of Mikhail Gorbachev, which was a huge event. Uh, the thawing of the Sino-Soviet uh, estrangement after 30 years. So that was my purpose of going to China, was to cover the Sino-Soviet summit. Uh, mm -hmm. Gorbachev was going to come and meet Deng Xiaoping and other Chinese leaders uh, and uh, make happy and uh, ease tensions between these two communist giants in Asia. And that was of great concern to uh, to Washington and Tokyo, Seoul, and uh, other countries in the region. Uh, and so that was the big story on our minds um, for about a day, because the, the, the next day, uh, uh, I arrived on May 12th, and uh, on May 13th, a number of students started a hunger strike on uh, Tiananmen Square. This was sort of a continuation of their protests in April when uh, Hu Yaobang died, and there was a great outpouring of uh, grief and mourning for this uh, leader who was seen as sympathetic to the students and the everyday man. So. Um, but within, by the time Gorbachev actually arrived on May 15th, just a couple of days earlier, the, the square was so uh, overrun by protesters and hunger strikers that uh, the Chinese couldn't hold a welcoming ceremony for him there. And it was almost as if the students were a bigger story from the moment uh, Gorbachev arrived because uh, he, they, they were controlling the agenda. Do you think Gorbachev felt shafted? I mean, there he was in China making history, and yet all anyone can talk about are these protesters in Tiananmen Square. Well, he's, in a way, he was kind of uh, uh, at the roots of it. The students, uh, many of them pointed out uh, uh, glasnost, you know, the mm -hmm. Gorbachev policy of openness and transparency, and uh, demanding it of their own leaders. Uh, and um, they were even... Uh, posters and banners that equated Mikhail Gorbachev with democracy. And so, uh, you know, he uh, he probably didn't get what he wanted uh, out of the, the, the trip. I'm sure he wanted a lot of pop and circumstance and attention. Um, but he, he played a bigger part in it than he probably realized. I mean, one of those parts he played was simply that there were lots of foreign journalists there like yourself who otherwise wouldn't have gone to China at that time. There were hundreds of foreign journalists in Beijing at that time with permits for live satellite link-ups, uh, extra uh, press accreditations for assistance, and press rooms set up for both the Chinese and the Soviet delegations in hotels in Beijing. And so the red carpet was pulled out, and China, the Chinese authorities were uh, expecting it to be a kind of a... Uh, uh, an arrival on the world scene of a modern China. Uh, you need to keep in mind this is 1989 and uh, there had never really been a world uh, worldwide event or news uh, uh, news event of global import that was being broadcast live daily uh, and um, this is sort of the origin of what some people call the CNN effect. CNN was there with um, a number of other networks, but CNN was a 24-hour cable network. And so they were always broadcasting about what was going on in Beijing. And uh, that really attuned a lot of people and news consumers, I think, to uh, the notion of turning on the TV at any time and being told right away what was going on about the biggest story in the world. Uh, and so, um, you know, unwittingly, yes, the, the Chinese authorities and, and the, 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 at the time, Soviet authorities um, uh, unwittingly 
played uh, a great role in the enhancement of uh, press coverage of breaking news. Well, that's absolutely delicious. Uh, <laughs> so were the protesters violent in calling for an end to the Communist Party? The protesters weren't violent at all. Um, they were uh, they, they were on a hunger strike to attract attention to their demands. Their demands were uh, such um, issues as uh, transparency by the government, uh, a dialogue with the government, uh, the, a recanting by the government of calling their earlier protests for Huiyabang and the current uh, hunger strike, uh, uh, and, and a retraction of calling it a counter-revolution and uh, chaos and hoodlumism. Uh, they also wanted, um, I thought rather presciently, uh, they called for uh, Chinese leaders to divulge their wealth and assets. Uh, but they're and humble the, servants. The, the <laughs> well, it was, at the, nonetheless, they were still, I mean, I remember one sign that I saw of a, uh, a protester. Uh, I took a picture of it, um, somebody riding in the back of a small pickup truck, and it, the sign said, Erdze which is, you know, the children are, are, are corrupt. What are you going to do about it? So pointing to nepotism that was well known among the Chinese uh, people at the time. So, you know, that kind of corruption was, uh, is, is not new. And uh, the, the idea of the leaders being selfless servants of the people was uh, uh, certainly not widely believed. Do you remember what the atmosphere was like uh, back in mid to late May? Oh, the atmosphere was, uh, it was, it was euphoric. It was incredible. It was a journalist's dream. Um, you know, for, uh, every day we would wake up knowing that we were covering the biggest story in the world, but we didn't know what direction that story was going to take that day. We knew that we were going to be the top high headline of all papers in the next day, but we didn't know what our lead was going to be. And I think for a journalist, that's actually a dream story. You know, you don't want to go to something that's so scripted that, you know, you could write it without even going. And that happens you know, too often these days. Uh, and it, the, the crowds were euphoric. They were they by you, you mentioned mid to late May. You know, this is uh, after martial law was declared around May 20th uh, and the hunger strike. That was seven days after the hunger strike started. And then you go forward another week, May 27th. Actually, that was kind of a downtime because people had been kind of petering out and uh, the, the protests had been petering out and people were retired. A lot of the students had returned to the Beijing universities and other students from the, the YT, you know, from the outside mm -hmm. areas had come in to, um, uh, to take their place. Not completely, but, but some of them. Um, and then they had this brilliant stroke on uh, May 29th, I think, to bring in the Goddess of Democracy statue that had been created by the students at the Academy of Fine Arts, Central Academy of Fine Arts. And uh, that just reinvigorated the, the spirit and it became kind of the carnival it was, but by that time, three weeks after the protests, still there had been no real concerted effort to try to remove the students from the square or to end the protests. You know, after martial law, the uh, you know, Li Peng declared martial law and the, the premier, and they had sent in um, army trucks, and they were immediately surrounded by thousands and thousands of citizens and protesters who scolded the the, the, uh, the, the soldiers and asked them why they were there, what did they think they were doing, did they know what they were doing, and then brought them bananas and instant noodles and things to to eat. Uh, uh, and so, you know, how can how can you attack a citizenry uh, that that's, uh, treats you like that? But um, I don't think their orders were to attack at that, at that time. Uh, so the atmosphere was it was thick. I mean, it was. I mean, it sounds like a cliche to say that the air was so thick you could slice it with a knife, but that's what it felt like. It was tension. It was euphoria. It was uncertainty. A lot of uh, um, apprehension about what might happen next, and um, and amid that, a genuine belief that China was on the verge of regime change. Well, so during the protests, you and the other Western reporters must have had some fears that the government was going to crack down on the protesters. But did you have any did, did you imagine what was coming? Uh, short answer is no, no, nothing to that extent, of course. Uh, there were rumors always, you know, I mean, they were, it, it, you know, the word yen, you know, for, for rumors was just everywhere because there were rumors that soldiers were 
um, in the sewers uh, beneath the uh, square, ready to jump out at any moment. There were rumors that the 27th and the 38th armies were in a in a shootout battle between themselves at a nearby Air Force base. Uh, rumors that leadership were, were going to resign. Um, uh, a lot of people uh, started and I think um, perpetuated rumors that they wanted to believe. Uh, but soldiers did start to appear in early June. Uh, it's not as though they suddenly appeared on the night of June 3rd. Um, around June 1st, and so there would be a few of them would come out from either the Great Hall of the People or um, the uh, Museum of Chinese History that faced it on the other side of uh, Tiananmen Square. Uh, there were another, a big, well, I don't know how big, but a battalion that, of soldiers that I saw, I, I couldn't count them, but I saw them camped out in a, a abandoned, not an abandoned, but an open construction area, um, sort of a little bit west of where the, uh, uh, the opera house is now. Uh, and so people knew that soldiers were in the area. Uh, on the night of uh, June 2nd, uh, I was in the AP Bureau, uh, which uh, was in the Qi uh, diplomatic compound that overlooked Chang'an Boulevard, and I heard these odd shuffling and um, grunting noises, and I looked out the window, and there were these large squares, sort of in marching formation of soldiers jogging toward Tiananmen Square. Uh, and uh, th this was like 24 hours before the actual um, assault with tanks and rifles came. These were young soldiers, unarmed. They looked like teenagers, and they were jogging toward the square from the east. And uh, I followed them down there in a the car. And uh, as dawn broke, they had been they were they were confronted and turned away by angry Beijing citizenry, many of whom had poured out of their apartments, hearing that this was going on, and turned these soldiers back. I mean, sent them. Uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of straggling back to where they came from with their tails between their legs. You know, they were hot, they were exhausted, they didn't know what they were doing. They were confused, they were young, and they were unarmed. Uh, and that was a major humiliation. Um, and I think it might have been a deliberate provocation, you know, Chinese authorities knowing that, okay, if we do this, we'll send these youngsters in um, without guns. You know, the, the crowds are going to turn them away, and that will give us an excuse to come in with the, the real hardware. So um, all day long on June 3rd, I mean, that was probably the most tense day that I've ever experienced. And uh, uh, again, we didn't know what was happening, but all kinds of rumors flying around. Soldiers are coming. They're going to come from this direction. They're going to come from that direction. And then after um, the sun went down, they actually did come in this time from the west. So where were you when the massacre began? I was staying in the Beijing Hotel at that time uh, on the 11th floor in the room that overlooked uh, Chang'an Boulevard, and I could see basically the top half of the square. Uh, so uh, you know, tanks and AK-47s are really loud in case uh, one doesn't realize that. I hadn't realized how loud they would be. You can hear them from very far away. Uh, and so they they were approaching from the from the east there were a couple of um, armored personnel carriers that were running around kind of randomly over on the west side of the square um, one of them got uh, stopped right in front of me it tried to run over the, some fencing from the square that people had uh, pulled across the street and it got stuck and people were throwing rocks and sticks i mean kind of a stone age attack on this uh, armored personnel carrier uh, and then um, set it uh, on fire basically with Molotov cocktails and eventually they forced the crew members out uh, I was watching this and they um, uh, they, they set upon these soldiers but there was sort of two factions there were there were citizens who were furious and trying to beat up these soldiers and there were others who looked like they could have been students who were trying to protect the soldiers eventually they hauled them off and put them on a bus and I don't know what happened uh, after that um, who was hauled off uh, the, stu the students or the soldiers? The, no, the, the 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 at least two crew members of this armored personnel carrier were hauled off by people who appeared to be so, um, students and put on a um, a municipal bus, one of the many buses that had been driven out there, either to block the path of any oncoming assault or to uh, be a shelter to the protesters. And you were watching this all from your hotel room. 
Well, I was watching this from the street. I was, I was oh, on okay. the ground uh, with, with them, and uh, I was taking uh, video. I wasn't taking much uh, photos because uh, in those days you had to be very uh, uh, e economic with your film and your um, video tape, which is what I had. So I was taking 8 millimeter analog videotape uh, at the time here and there. Uh, and I, yeah, a lot of times I didn't want to take something because I thought something more important might happen. And, you know, gee, how much time do I have left? on my uh my machine how much batteries do i have left so i was taking some a, a few videos here and there not many photos uh, and um at one point i went back up to my hotel because i was filing um radio reports back to ap radio from my hotel telephone uh and i went back in it was sometime during the night it was before the tanks had reached the western edge of the square and um i kind of walked into a trap there was a uh a plainclothes uh, police uh, uh, public security officer and three uniformed police in the lobby of the hotel. Uh, and they stopped me as I was trying to bustle up to my room and uh, and, 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 and searched me. And they, they found this video tape that I had and confiscated it. And it was close to two hours of video that I had taken over the previous uh, several days. Uh, and uh, I just, I said, what are you doing? And the, there was a hotel staffer there who was standing by kind of sheepishly and powerlessly and he just said ha ha more show up it's been huh. confiscated you know and so um i lost that two hours of uh, of tape which i've obviously never um recovered i did go up to my room from there and was filing um reports and th that was the time when the the tanks and, and soldiers came onto the square they turned the lights off of the square so you couldn't really see what was going on um i did take a picture uh, at night when the lights were still on and you could see that the goddess of democracy, uh, democracy statue was still standing. So it was sometime, I don't know, right after midnight, probably. Uh, and, um, um, the, the, I had been told that I, I couldn't leave the, ho the hotel that I was basically under sort of house arrest. Uh, so I, I spent the rest of it overlooking the, uh, rest of the night overlooking the hotel and filing, uh, reports by telephone. What was the feeling when you realized what was happening? Well, the, the, you could hear the guns, like I say, from quite you know miles away, it seemed. Uh, and uh, I, I never thought that they were shooting uh, people on their way into the square. Um, I thought tanks, I said, wow, this is kind of overkill, but uh, this is the decision that they reached to have to make it all the way into the square. Um, but I mean, I, I did see people get shot. I saw people and as the sun rose, uh, it, it didn't stop. They didn't just shoot their way into the square at night and then stop. They, the soldiers formed a cordon, a line that uh, all the way across Chang'an Boulevard, uh, uh, on the east end of the square. And I was on the outs, my, my hotel was on the outside of that a few hundred yards away. Um, and then the Chinese people, if you know, if you know Chinese people, you know that they love to kan you know, they love to go see what's going on. And so there were crowds of people out on the street uh, and in the middle of the street. And what would happen was the soldiers would rush forward and you'd hear a lot of gunshots. You'd see all kinds of uh, um, uh, abandoned bikes and jackets uh, left in the, in the middle of the street as everybody fled. The soldiers would walk back to their perimeter and then people would come in and and load people who had been shot and take them away on these uh, these sunwenche, you know, the, uh, the the tricycles to take them to uh, um, any uh, some of the nearby hospitals, such as uh, the Sierra Hospital, Peking Union Medical College, and that happened over, uh, I mean, repeatedly. And so, uh, you know, the Chinese say no one was killed in the square. Um, I I believe that. I believe no one was probably no one was killed in the square. The bulk of the fatalities were on um, uh, on the boulevard approaching the square from the west where the tanks shot their way in. They didn't come from the east. Um, but there were people who were shot on the eastern edge of the square on the morning of June 4th when these uh, uh, soldiers and the people who went to Kanruna would just repeat this cycle over and over. So instead of it being called the Tiananmen Square Massacre, it should just be called the Beijing Massacre. Yeah, I mean, the protests were centered at Tiananmen Square. Uh, the journalists all uh, had, uh, I mean, it became a buzzword. Uh, journalists had um, uh, shorthand for it, calling it 
squared or T2 or TS. Uh, and so uh, it became known as that. So, but you're right. I mean, the, the word Tenement Square Massacre is kind of a misnomer. It's interesting, though, that how, uh, I don't know if you know about the people who are kind of like Tiananmen Square Massacre truthers, who, like, there's a, especially among young uh, Chinese people, there's this whole thing about it didn't happen, that was, uh, it nobody ever got shot, and, like, they kind of used that information about the fact that nobody was shot in the square and kind of twisted to make it seem like that means nobody was shot. <laughs> Yeah, the the um, uh, it's it's twisting words. Uh, on one hand, it's twisting truth. Um, on the other, you know, there was a news conference a few days afterwards that um, uh, the AP got in trouble for because the AP was one of the few who attended this this event, uh, and the reporter who went was not a Chinese speaker and worked off of the translator, and the. Um, the the person giving the briefing was talking about soldiers coming in uh, to to clear the square and said, "Wang er, xiang," <clears throat> and, and the Chinese official said, uh, "Xiang tian kai le chang," which means sh- they they shot into the air uh-huh. in, in, toward the sky, and the translator instead of saying "xiang tian," translated it as as "xiang guangchang." So. Misinterpreted the the official as saying uh, saying Tiananmen instead of Tian, and so the the interpreter said, and the soldiers shot into the square, whereas ah. the, the the original words were the soldiers shot into the sky, uh, and AP reported that, and the Chinese got super uh, they were furious about that and made uh, uh, made that reporter come in for uh, a tongue lashing and <clears throat> obliged AP to uh, issue a correction, but. It was the, the 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 faulty material was actually supplied by the the translator. Those kinds of things can add to the the debate or the mystery over what really did happen when. I'm curious what happened to some of the people that you interviewed while you were there. Well, that's one of the the kind of gut wrenching realizations that um, a lot of reporters had after June 4th, because. Until that time, like I said, it was sort of a reporter's dream in reporting a huge story, but you didn't know what the outcome every day was going to be. This, the people on the square were so euphoric and so certain that they were on an unstoppable trajectory that everybody talked openly, giving their names and their schools and majors and hometowns and things like that. And, of course, Western reporters uh, are supposed to use... Uh, supposed to ask people's names and their ages and their occupations and their hometowns and include as much of that as uh, as possible when interviewing, um, which many of us did. So we don't know what happened to the people we we interviewed. Um, I got to know some people uh, better. Uh, I would see them repeatedly, and I didn't quote them um, because I didn't not because I was concerned of them being hurt which i should have been but i was concerned about blowing my sources i didn't want <clears throat> to name people who were um uh, uh either providing me information or opinion but many of the student leaders you know we know all the ones you know who were kai si wang dan li lu chai ling uh, uh zhang bo li uh, uh, etc were widely quoted all the time in the press. Uh, and they were, uh, I think all of them, were on the most wanted list of uh, 21 people sought after the the square was retaken. So I can only imagine that uh, those were the ones who were publicly named and many of them were, were caught and jailed uh, by Chinese authorities. What about all those who weren't prom- uh, prominent leaders or figures but nonetheless, were named in all these news stories um, uh, by by Western reporters. So I, I don't know, but it does make me heart sick to think that something bad might have ha- happened to any of them. Uh, were you ever concerned about your own safety in the midst of this? I took some foolish risks uh, as a younger reporter. You know, I hadn't covered wars before at the time. 
uh, I knew that one of the regulations of martial law was that you couldn't use binoculars or cameras and that uh, they were sound trucks that were going around broadcasting uh, through speakers. Anybody using binoculars or cameras could be dealt with on the spot. Hmm. Uh, and I asked somebody on the sp uh, what, what they meant by, by truly be, by being handled. And they said, oh, you'll be shot. Hmm. <clears throat> and I, I knew that I, I kind of foolishly felt that, well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a journalist and I'm a foreigner and uh, I, it didn't apply to me. So uh, there was one night after June 4th, I was driving south on the west side of the second ring road and I heard a number of machine gun blasts and uh, somebody had said, you know, oh, you can't get close because they'll, they'll, they'll keep you away. And I realized that, realized that there were no other cars on the street. I pulled over immediately, turned off my lights, and I said, um, you know, there's one time that reason got the better of me. And I said, OK, I'm going to turn around and, and, and come back. But worse than that was around June uh, 6th or 7th, um, a big column of uh, soldiers was marching east out of the square and I had a bike I was out there at the time and I, I saw them and I, so I took some pictures from the side from, from in between trees and then I, I pedaled down to a place where I was way ahead of them at the International Hotel which is uh, at the big intersection where the main train station at the time was and I positioned myself in the middle of the street facing them the front of this column and I was taking pictures with this 200 millimeter lens and uh, I had planned my escape route that if I needed to, that I would just go over to the International Hotel and go inside because I had been inside and I knew my way around. So these guys, they came closer and one guy started barking out to the to others, to, to soldiers, and I saw two of them start running toward me. So I said, okay, this is where I <laughs> go to the to the International Hotel. So I, I ran um, across the street, uh, um, well, from the middle of the street, across the northern half toward the uh, International Hotel. And I heard two very loud sh gunshots uh, ring out. I, I don't know if they were aiming at me or aiming you know, toward me. Um, and so I just kept running. And I got up to the International Hotel door and found that it had been barricaded from the inside uh, and, and, and wouldn't, wouldn't open. Um, there was a small uh, Mian Bao Che, you know, the uh, little um, uh, minivan that was parked right in front of it. And so I just ducked down behind it, between it and the door to the hotel, and furiously began unwinding my film uh, and pulled the canister out and stuck it in my sock just to, so it was, would not be visible, uh, and just waited to say, okay, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. Um, and they didn't come. And so I looked out from underneath the minivan and I could see them walking away. They had come pretty close, but I guess they had assumed that I had gotten inside the hotel and so that it wouldn't be worth it or would be too difficult to go in to try to find me for whatever purpose they might have. So I just waited for them, this whole battalion or whatever, to pass. And when they had gone well past the hotel, I came out and went in the other direction and hopped over a fence back to where I had parked a bicycle. And there's a crowd of Chinese there who had been standing, you know, onlookers just watching all that was going on. And when they saw me, they all burst into applause and gave me a, an, an ovation, which was quite unexpected. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was like a but, play. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it was not in, in, in intentional. And I certainly wouldn't uh, do, do that again. And I was, that's why I say I was, I was, rather foolish in putting myself into into danger uh, like that. Those are back in the days when news organizations didn't offer their reporters a hostile environment reporting training. Now it's almost mandatory if you go to a place like the Gulf. Uh, and, um, and I did do it, uh, but not until 2011. <laughs> what about a place like, I don't know, Hong Kong? Well, in Hong Kong, um, I I wouldn't be worried about being shot, but I just saw uh, this morning a video of a photographer being very directly, uh, I wouldn't even say tear gassed. It looked like it was a, um, a a hose, like a garden hose of pepper gas that was sprayed directly on him. Uh, and that's what I would be worried about for, for being in Hong Kong. Um, 
I at this point I wouldn't worry about being being shot. But as we as we speak, these protests against the extradition bill are getting more and more intense, and uh, I think Hong Kong police are being very restrained in in the um, in the kind of uh, uh, you know, reaction and security that they're providing. But you know they're not Chinese soldiers, and so. You know, in the event that Chinese soldiers ever show up, or after 2047, if they're there, uh, yeah, I would be worried. Uh, do, do you think the Tiananmen Square massacre was a turning point in Chinese history? You know, it's it's always been a a big uh, big question. You know, China had such uh, dramatic economic development uh, in the years after. After Tiananmen, you know, was it was it because the Tiananmen crackdown happened? Was it despite the Tiananmen crackdown happening? Um, I do think it was a turning point um, because um, you just you haven't seen any any mass protests against the government uh, since then. Nobody dares on the on the public side, on the Chinese side, on the government side. They don't allow it. I mean, they know where they went wrong. You know, I lived in China as a uh, in Beijing as a reporter from 2011. I'm sorry, 2010 to 2013, uh, and I would uh, go past the Tiananmen Square uh, frequently because I lived on the east side of it. And my office was on the west side. Uh, I would frequently drive past it, and sometimes very late at night or in the wee hours of the morning. And uh, I would pass the square, and I would look out, and I would try to count how many police cars or police vehicles I could see that had their lights flashing and it was usually around 12 uh, and that would be at like sometimes even three in the morning so I figured if I could see 12 then there was probably you know 25 others that I couldn't see uh, you know, the government is very um, aware of uh, of any group of, of people with a grievance um, on Tiananmen Square one one time when I went, uh, I, I went many times, I don't remember if it was on one of the anniversaries or not, but there was a group of people taking a souvenir picture in front of the, uh, well, with the Gate of Heavenly Peace as a background, and they pulled out a banner uh, of their company and just held it in front of them, uh, you know, as a, as a souvenir of, you know, Company ABC visited uh, Tiananmen Square. And immediately a couple of uniformed policemen rushed over and uh, told them that they had to stop, they had to put that away. And it was nothing provocative. It was just a souvenir picture. It wasn't like a Tibetan flag or anything. So after they took their picture, I sauntered over and asked them, I said, hey, what do those policemen tell you anyway? And they said, oh, they said, yeah, we, they said, we couldn't do this uh, uh, because of trademark issues that we're not allowed to use the image of uh, Tiananmen for advertising purposes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and, and I said, oh, how clever, you know, that, that's a, an excuse you can use uh, at any time for any activity, and it sounds reasonable. You can't really argue against it, but it doesn't really belie what what the true motivations uh, are. So, um, uh, I think it was a turning point because, um, I mean, another turning point is is the internet. I mean, imagine if the internet had existed uh, for people. Imagine if cell phones and Twitter had existed or Weibo, uh, that and then the the protests would have gone nationwide instantly I and mean, already they were in more than 80 cities uh, thanks to Chinese media coverage uh, but what if there had been such you know blanket internet coverage um, student uh, not students uh, just just people uh, again with with grievances you know they do they do protest they go to the office of petitions and they go to their local uh, city or provincial offices uh, but it's not political uh, protests such as um, that, uh, you know, a leader, not like the Li Peng Xia Tai, you know, the mm -hmm. Li Peng must step down the uh, uh, slogans that we heard before. Um, uh, it's it's more individual cases, you know, the grievance, you know, I, my, my land was taken from me or, or this, this, this company or this neighbor is polluting, you know, where I live. Uh, and so, so the Chinese government has, has realized that they, they can allow protests. They have to allow a, a way for people to blow off steam or to express grievances. But there are certain kinds of protests that they cannot allow, such as calling for leaders to step down or for uh, changes in uh, uh, in the government or criticism of the party. I mean, we've seen that 
in the uh, uh, the the bombing of the uh, the, uh, the U.S. bombing of the Chinese embassy in Belgrade, I think, in 1999. Um, the, uh, uh, the EP3 incident in Hainan where the American spy plane you know, you know, hit a Chinese fighter and was forced to land in, in Hainan in, uh, uh, when was that? Was that um, 2003? I, uh, I, I don't remember. Yeah, back, back then. Um, and the... Uh, virulent uh, anti-Japanese protests of 2012 over the uh, Senkaku Daoyu Islands uh, disputed between Japan and China. All of those, there were uh, very vociferous uh, uh, protests by Chinese citizens against either the U.S. Embassy or the Japanese Embassy, uh, to the extent of, of quite serious vandalism, you know, breaking windows, throwing rocks and breaking windows at the U.S. Embassy, throwing eggs and water bottles at the Japanese Embassy, while riot police just stood by and uh, let them, the protesters uh, swing by in waves, uh, unload and then go to reload and come back for another pass to throw more things at the embassy and chant anti-US, anti-Japanese slogans. Uh, many of those were bust in, in the case of the anti-US protests, and certainly facilitated, uh, uh, enabled in the anti-Japan protests. And then the next day, everything you know, was swept away and they say, okay, you can go home now and it's over and uh, we have to let traffic back through because it's a Monday. Um, I mean, it's clear that, that the government you know, facilitates protests that, that, that are to its, you know, for its purposes um, that don't threaten their own uh, existence. They're meaning either, you know, the party or government institutions. Right. I mean, uh, I, I believe article 35 of China's constitution says, uh, we allow freedom of speech as long as you're speaking ill of hostile foreign forces. <laughs> well, that, uh, that that says it all. In that case, it's um, um, it's uh, uh, yeah. The worry is that such protests might morph into something like what we saw in 1989, uh, because it's kind of a tinderbox. Um, it could be very. Um, uh, you know, a, a, a small step to go from uh, a uh, protest against a state-owned enterprise that is polluting a city to spread beyond that to, oh, well, this is a result of the policy and the party. Uh, and, um, and that's, you know, the one thing that authorities don't want to see. Well, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your story about Tiananmen. Well, uh, thanks for for asking. I think it's a uh, a, a story that uh, that that should be understood, should not be covered up. You know, in, among my students, I have a number who are from China, uh, and they're all very curious about what happened because they know that well, sometimes not until they get here, but they do know that there's something that uh, that happened that they're not allowed to learn about or speak about uh, back home, and so. They're uh, quite intensely uh, interested uh, in in what happens. Sometimes they challenge it, and that's fine. And I think that this, you know, history is something to be debated, but not to be uh, swept under the rug. Well said. So thank you, everyone, for listening. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Jung. And I'm Matt Ganesta. See you next time.